much time with my guest, uh, Mark Volman, uh, ex, uh, well, still singer for the Turtles. But if you do want a free cassette of The Cool Nerd, uh, watch for the uh, phone number or email address at the end of the show, and I'll send you one completely free. Like I said, I'm really honored and real happy to have uh, Mark Volman with me today. Mark, thank you very, very much. It's great to be here. I've been, I was listening to your music since I was a little kid. and oh, That's a good so way to start out oh, as a little oh, kid. Well, you know. <laughs> But I mean, a little kid, I was about 13 or 14, it goes back uh, that far. It is a long time. In fact, uh, I don't want to talk too much because I want you to speak mostly. We have a lot to talk about. But when I first was taking guitar lessons, I remember one of the first uh, songs my guitar teacher uh, taught me was uh, Happy Together. And I think I still even have one of my little files somewhere, the guitar le little paper stuff. So it's really a... It has been a song that um, has been used in so many different ways. I was at a wedding just this weekend, uh -huh. and it was sung right in the middle of the service that I didn't even know I was going to be uh, there looking at, but it was pretty amazing. Wow, that is amazing. Well, you know, um, if you don't mind, I know we, I really want to talk about your current projects uh -huh. now, especially your teaching at Loyola Marymount College. On, you have a course on the music business. And that's kind of with the thrust of this show anyway, to share with up and coming artists information on, on how they can be, and myself, how we can be successful and learn from people, especially people such as yourself. But can you give us a little synopsis of how your career started? Sure. I know you had surf music and... Um, basically, we uh, all met in high school in Los Angeles at uh, Westchester High School, uh -huh. uh, out by the Los Angeles airport as a surfing band. Uh, we were called the Crossfires, and um, about two years into our career playing the normal high school shows that you did, Moose Lodge, Elk Lodge, uh, Moose Lodge yeah. every lodge named after an animal I think uh -huh. we played, um, <laughs> we uh, were given the opportunity to make a record um, right after the British invasion sort of came and uh, kind of slaughtered American music about 1964. And a record company called White Whale, yet right. another animal, um, <laughs> offered us a chance to record three songs. And mm -hmm. um, one of the songs that we recorded uh, went on to be our first top 10 record in the United States, a record called It Ain't Me, Babe. The Dylan song. Right, and we changed our name. Um, just before the record was released from the crossfires to the turtles and uh, we began a five-year run at the charts that included um, in a row it ain't me babe let me be you baby we had a hiatus for about six months where we lost two members of the band and picked up uh, two new members and recorded a record that would be called uh, happy together that would become what every group sort of hopes to have with that career record mm -hmm. and um, in a row we had happy together she'd rather be with me um, you sh uh, you know what I mean and she's my girl Eleanor uh, Eleanor came uh, a little bit later about 1969 yeah uh, Eleanor and you showed me that the... was a great era of music too so much excellent music oh, during yeah. that time. Were you uh, writing these, most of these songs or co-writing um, or some we, of them? Uh, most of the time when we were making albums uh, or making records, we'd go in with probably two or three songs that were written by us and mm -hmm. then we would probably go in with some songs that the record company felt a little bit more comfortable uh, with in terms of radio type records, uh, but these were records written by people who had written uh, many hit records before, Carole King, David mm -hmm. Gates, uh, uh, Phil Sloan and Steve Barry. Uh, That's Philip P.F. Sloan? P.F. Sloan, right. yeah. Right, I had, I had him not too recently on that. So, uh, so yeah, the great. record company uh, always chose the singles and uh, felt that they had a little bit better idea of what would sell than we did, which they probably did. And mm -hmm. uh, so we, uh, we ended up having uh, 122 written songs as the Turtles. Mm -hmm. And for every hit record, we had the B-side. And uh, probably uh, about 90% of every album was written by the group. But most of the singles, probably about 75% of them were written by outside writers. Mm -hmm. And we had a few that we wrote. A little music business thing. And back in the days of the 45s, 
if you even had wrote the B side, you got as much actual money, didn't you, as the person who sold the well, A side, except for maybe mechanical the mechanical royalties. Mechanical, yeah, yeah um, performance royalties, um, which uh, are paid to the songwriter for airplay. Mm -hmm. And so the songwriters who had the A side were paid uh, oh, yeah. considerably more by the amount of time that it actually got on the radio. But uh, in terms of mechanical, uh, sheet music, mm -hmm. um, visual synchronization rights and things like that. If the songs got used for those in, in those ways and most of our songs came out with a portfolio of folio of songs every time an album came out so yeah. people be able to go out and buy the sheet music. I could music. have it in my guitar lesson yeah. and learn the chords and yeah. all that. Yeah, that's, that's exactly right. That's perfect. So, it was a good run. Uh, Turtles had a great run at the charts through 1970. It was interrupted by some severe litigation uh, and the group split up um, in kind of a frenzy around 1970 and Howard and I, Howard Kalin, um, and I continued on uh, as a singing duo uh, known as Flo and Eddie mm -hmm. and went off and worked with Frank Zappa and the Mothers of Invention for about two and a half years in, and uh, we did five or six albums with Frank in a motion picture called 200 Motels. Mm -hmm. right. and, um, then became what I call the survival years. After we left the Zappa days, we did five albums as Flo and Eddie, which were all pretty much ignored by the American public and the record companies. Mm. And uh, we uh, got involved in television writing at NBC Comedy, at NBC working mm. on some extremely successful television projects with Richard Pryor show and Lily Tomlin show. and. Mm worked with a producer named Rocco Urbisi who had created the Midnight Special mm -hmm. along with um, um, two or three other people and Rocco was pretty much the uh, director of the shows and uh, we uh, created music for uh, some television characters known as the Care Bears mm -hmm. and wrote all the original songs for a little cartoon character called Strawberry Shortcake mm, I remember which uh, got us nominated for a children's Grammy oh. and um, we began touring again in 1984 as the Turtles mm -hmm. um, on a Happy Together tour that put us out for two years to hit over 300 cities in two years and has continued our touring as the Turtles since 1986 uh, very heavily. This year we did over 65 concerts wow. and have continued to do 50 to 100 shows every year since 1984. You put those together, don't you, with other artists also? Yeah, uh, I have been the sole manager of the Turtles um, mm -hmm. since about 19, oh, around 1979 I took over the job, so I've learned a lot about the business side of it and we have an agent who takes care of the business of booking the band, uh, Paradise see. Artists um, up in uh, Ojai, California and they've yeah. been with us since 1984. So you, you've done, done many uh, different facets of the music business than just uh the, just the turtles, of course, that's a big part part of it. But uh. I think the turtles has given uh, us, a, and I say us, my partner and I, a tremendous foundation to have explored a lot of different avenues. And I say it became kind of a survivalist training because mm. when the 60s kind of faded away and we worked with Frank Zappa, it opened up um, a different area in terms of radio and you began to understand the different dynamics in terms of genres of music and the radio. Um, airplay was broken down into so many different mm -hmm. areas and to learn how to understand where your songs fit into the different avenues of radio became another area you had to really concern yourself with. Yeah, I remember uh, the, during the Turtles days, I remember I would just listen to my little AM radio there by my bed. Sure. But then when I remember then getting into Zappa, then uh, that was when AM, I mean, I'm sorry, FM. Right. FM started and had all those wild uh, sure. FM stations. Well, you know, when the R Turtles were making music, we were part of a musical time when there were no color barriers and there was no, I mean, you could hear Ray Stevens sing Guitar Zan, you could hear uh, Herman's Hermits mm -hmm. singing, you could hear uh, the Beatles, the Turtles, the Temptations, Four Tops, there was soul music, there was uh, country music, and there was white pop. 
And, uh, novelty songs. Novelties, and everything got heard on one station. And yeah. nowadays, with the breakup of the formats in radio, you have to have a, mm -hmm. a, a station on your uh, on your car to hit about a hundred different stations if you're interested in really hearing contemporary hits, urban, soul, R&B, and like going, country. It's like going to the hospital, it's all specialized now. It's all specialized and yeah. it's, it, it, it detracts from really young people being able to hear all the different styles. Get locked, they get locked into one little one click style, thing. One style, yeah. That's it's, true. It kind of hurts. Before we get into the concepts you cover in your class, let me just ask you a couple things. Sure. Uh, the, the litigation stuff with the, the record company White Wells, it's kind of well known and people that study the record business a little bit. And I wondered, uh, it, maybe it's kind of a negative, but for myself and people that are coming up, would like to avoid some problems. What was the problem? They own your name, Turtles. Yes. They own 100% of the publishing. They own everything. Uh, and you were young then. You were like 17 or 16 or something when you signed this. When we signed our original agreement, we were just turning 18 years old, and we were very excited about being in the mm -hmm. music business. Sure. And we didn't really understand the concept of the music business. We understood we wanted to make music, and that was about it. So when somebody offered us an opportunity to make records, we signed everything away at that opportunity, not really considering that our career would last longer than one song, perhaps. Uh -huh. and. Um, as the years went on and we began having hit songs and then the continuing saga year in and year, at, year out of competing for the marketplace in terms of getting on the radio, we learned more and more about owning ourselves and mm -hmm. owning our publishing and owning our songwriting. Mm -hmm. And uh, about 1970, we audited the record company and found a tremendous amount of money had been mishandled. and so through the Harry Fox Agency, right. which is an organization that musicians can bring in to audit for them. We audited the record company and found a discrepancy of a little over $600,000 during one six-month period. Wow. So we sued our record company for $2 million, and they sued us back. And by suing us back, what they did is they prevented us from using the name the Turtles to make records, and we couldn't use our individual names either, Mark Volman and Howard Kalin, because every contract calls for you to sign an agreement mm -hmm. as an individual and collectively. Individually and collectively means you can't make records on your own and you can't make records as that group. And mm -hmm. so that became a four-year litigation, and through that litigation began my interest in sort of schooling myself on the business of music and mm -hmm. understanding more and more about the legalities that kind of uh, encompass the music industry. And it became a lifelong commitment that got me into managing the band as well as where my class at Loyola Marymount takes students. Right. And so. Yeah, let's talk a little bit about that. You just uh, recently uh, completed your BA and you're working on a master's now? Yes. I, what inspired you to, uh, to do that after such a successful music career and all? Well, one of the things I noticed touring around the United States is the amount of um, young musicians and even older musicians who know very little about the music business. They know that they write songs and they want to be successful, but they don't understand the even smallest uh, uh, thing about what it uh, entitles in terms of signing about publishing, owning their copyrights, who owns the name if you're a band, and all of the elements that go into protecting themselves. And so at that point I became very interested in putting together a project where I could make myself available to teach young people Mm -hmm. uh, about the music business and I began uh, writing a book about four, four and a half years ago and at that point um, I had some discussions with people who said why don't you get into the education business and um, I had never gone to college so four and a half years ago I started at Loyola Marymount University and mm -hmm. um, it was my hope that I would graduate and be able to move into teaching and they have given me the opportunity and uh, it's opened up a 
myriad of opportunities with a lot of universities now. We have over 300 universities in the United States who have programs involving music business programs and mm -hmm. uh, I have become highly sought after yeah. because of my experience in the Turtles and with the Mothers of Invention and it, with Flo and Eddie and I'm finding a lot of universities are beginning to offer the curriculum so that young musicians now have the opportunity. So yeah. we've opened up a course at Loyola Marymount that is available to not only the undergraduates but it's also open to the mass public and um, they can uh, take my class. It's a 15-week course. Mm -hmm. It's 45 hours of music business teaching and um, as I was explaining to you earlier we've had tremendous amount of response. Uh, this semester alone I've had the manager of a band uh, called the Presidents of the United States, right. uh, people from William Morris, uh, uh, Mickey, Dolan, you told Mickey me. Dolan's from the Monkees, Jerry Beckley from America held a seminar in one of my classes about songwriting and um, we have a new semester starting in January and um, my, really my main intention of doing the show is coming out to get you to well, sign up. I'm because, there. <laughs> because I'm there, I know definitely. your involvement uh, is sort of like what I'm doing. I find that we have uh, pretty much the same interest in what your show is about is a lot about what my class is about which is opening up the lines of communication between your experience and the people who you bring on and that's the same of what I'm doing in my class is bringing my experience to a classroom mm -hmm. along with the uh, guests that I bring in and my 35 years with the turtles brings some really fun stories too. We, we use a lot of um, life experience mm. and so you get like a, a, an hour, three hour interview almost every week of just mm. really some really um, massive information. So, I know I'm sure we could talk for hours. We can make this a three hour show but I know you covered things like um, you know uh, attorneys and business managers yes. and even the unions and the guilds and the music publishing and copyrights and record promote, uh, production and merchandising, that's what I want to find out about. Distribution I want to ask you about I, too. Do you have any suggestions? I know uh, reading some material uh, about you, you suggested that the up and coming artist is, is a good idea. You should maybe make your own CD as your demos, is that right? Well I think nowadays record companies are, are looking for artists who are really prepared to be in the music business and they see this in a lot of ways. Uh, one of the ways they see it is having a live show that's really successful. They mm. want to see an artist who can handle a crowd and bring in their own crowd. Uh, they want to see young bands who have put together uh, CDs and have uh, the capabilities of selling and that. Selling them. Right. SoundScan now allows independent records oh. to be sold at record stores and SoundScan is what the, the major charts are all uh, called from. It, it, it's what the little barcode, the barcode on the back yeah. of a record is. Is it on the My record? first CD I did. Right there. My first CD I put up my own little CD. We forgot to put the barcode on right. there. <laughs> and so those barcodes run through, it's all computerized and it lets a record company know if you've sold a couple thousand CDs, 5,000 CDs. And there's documentation there too, you just not Absolutely, saying. and uh, a good promo package, there's so many elements. They also would like you to have maybe a real strong management or a good attorney so that they feel that when this artist and this company come together there's something that's going to happen on the business side of things so that it won't take a lot of time. I mean a record company is not going to be very negotiable with a mm -hmm. brand new artist, not like mm -hmm. they would be with a... But they want to speak with somebody who knows what, at least what they're talking Absolutely. about. Absolutely. That's the first thing uh, any young artist or young band would want to know going in is that mm -hmm. they should have somebody representing them so that they are having the, their best interests looked after because there isn't a musician watching this show out there and knows how to really get around all of the mm. 
the kind of quirks that get into publishing ownership, what happens if a song they record on an album ends up in a movie. I mean, there's so many questions. And it's just like when I'm with a young group, I'll say, who owns the name? And the five of them will all look at each other like, what do you mean we can actually own the name? I mm -hmm. mean, okay. the story of the band Journey, when Steve mm -hmm. Perry left the group, and Steve Perry wanted to record under the name Journey because he said, I'm the lead singer, I'm the voice of the band. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, the four other members sued to keep the name and they won. Mm -hmm. So what you find out by getting involved in the music business is a lot more than just having a song, get to the charts, go out on the road. There is a tremendous amount of stuff that you're going to want to protect yourself mm -hmm. and this will save you maybe years and years. I mean the Turtles lawsuit ended up four years long just to get back our name Right. A name we had you created. You came up in high school. In high school. And here we had two guys at a record company say they own the name. So, I mean, that cost us at the time over $70,000 to just get back what was rightfully Well, owned. I know I'm a little off the subject, but I know even the, even the Beatles uh, don't even own most of their own right. songs because of things they signed early. In the Beatles are documented to probably have had one of the worst record deals ever in the history. I mean, when they originally signed with Parlophone, mm -hmm. it was because Brian Epstein couldn't make a deal for them in any other record label, and he basically gave them away. They gave them a 1% deal with five, split five ways, which included Brian Epstein, and that was because they went to George Martin. And that deal held, in fact, up until until Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band. So I know through uh, a considerable amount of information that I have uh, investigated that this is a group that probably never really made a lot of money until the reissues happened several years ago, other than Paul McCartney and other than the John Lennon estate, mm -hmm. because uh, George Harrison and Ringo Starr were just not looked after. Mm -hmm. These are things that were acceptable in the 60s, and I just just want to say, really, quite honestly, they're just as acceptable today. I mean, if we uh, if we spoke to members of the band Smashing Pumpkins or Pearl Jam or uh, where you know where's the bass player from Nirvana today? I mean, mm -hmm. what kind of future is held for them? without protecting themselves. And mm -hmm. this goes on every day in the music industry, and that's why shows like this and uh, classes like mine become valuable um, things that young musicians can watch and come to and take so that they can uh, school themselves. Uh, I think, you know, when we were speaking earlier, and I think you said something like, you know, three months of education in a class can save you five years in a, in a, in a courtroom. Mm -hmm. And that's really mm -hmm. what, you know, just like tonight, uh, you know, or today or whenever you're watching this, just knowing um, that these things go on make you a little bit leery about jumping in and just signing something. Uh, right. Everybody, sh you, you should, you know, grab a hold of an attorney and... That's what was going to be something I was going to ask you was, uh, should you uh, right in the initial stages be looking for this representation? Should you wait till you s there's some interest coming your way or... It's a good question and uh, it's one of the ones that people ask a lot is when do I need mm -hmm. uh, somebody and uh, quite honestly an attorney probably isn't needed until you're really ready to make a, a deal and that's why you wouldn't want to bring an attorney in mm -hmm. because they're going to want money uh -huh. and so the longer you can kind of keep them out of the picture the minute that there's something uh, surfacing that could be uh, a necessity in terms of negotiating an attorney would be absolutely uh, a necessity. I, would, I wouldn't even want just a manager doing it. Right. I guess you could ask around, get a little word of mouth first. So Definitely. That so uh, more you can think ahead, I guess. Absolutely. There are names on the backs of albums that young mm. people buy, uh, names of management companies, names of agents, names of attorneys sometimes. And mm. if there are just groups that you like, yeah. pick up a CD and, um, and read the name of a manager and call them up. And um, mm. managers are not impossible to get in touch with and agents. Everybody wants to make a living off of you if you're a successful musician.
Uh -huh. And if you're talented especially, uh -huh. and the opportunity for a manager to make 20% of your life Mm -hmm. is a good is a good like the Billy Joel deal yeah I mean uh, like the Bruce Springsteen deal which uh, started out at 20 percent and elevated itself to cl almost 50 when he finally stopped recording uh, before the river and sued Mike Appel to get really his life back because when Bruce signed his original deal he didn't understand or give himself enough credit to think that he was going to be successful there were steps written into it yes. that the more successful, the more they would get, the exactly. manager would get? Oh. Exactly. And, and one of the things that a young musician has to do from day one is say, I'm, I'm worth something. And he has to understand that he is in the driver's seat. And um, if this manager wants too much, there are other managers, especially if you are talented and you write a lot of songs and uh, you have a little bit of a following. And you musicians are not shut off from the feeling that they have fans growing and at the point when you're building an audience and you have fans who want to hear your CD mm -hmm. and I recommend making uh, music uh, as a demo I mean uh, making demonstrations of what you do um, it can go all the way from three songs four songs uh, of quality uh, tape um, mm -hmm. uh, with a nice package just like you've done with your package okay. <laughs> um, to uh, CDs where uh, groups will make a, a whole CD to mm -hmm. showcase uh, the artistry that kind of shows off a lot of different areas that they move in. So we have to feel musicians are worse. We get so excited that <laughs> after s six people showing up at your last eight gigs, you know, if somebody shows interest, you're willing to sign anything, huh? It's absolutely true, and it, there's nothing wrong with that. It's just trying to school yourself. I think mm -hmm. every industry, you need a, a form of education. The people running these cameras had to learn how to do it. The people sitting in that room mm -hmm. pushing the buttons. Uh, what, what we do uh, as an industry takes uh, schooling and being a musician um, and if they're a songwriter you want to learn about publishing and ownership and yeah. copyright and the difference between BMI and ASCAP. And I know one place you can get a lot of that information is your class. I'm going to be there. I want okay. to thank you so much. Look at all these questions I wanted to ask you. Call him. Call if him. If you're interested in uh, getting a hold of uh, Mark Volman from the Turtles or his class or anything, please call the number you see at the end of the, the program or you can email too. I really want to thank you very oh, much. Oh, my pleasure. Anytime. Okay, we'll do hopefully another one. Okay, bye-bye now. Without 